Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of What's New in Enterprise Maps. My name is Brad Songer, and I work on the Google Enterprise Maps team here in our New York City office. Today, via Hangouts on Air, I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague, uh, familiar to many of our previous viewers, Ajay Hamnani. Ajay, it's great to see you. Thank you, Brad. Happy to be here. Well, I know just like previous episodes, I know you have a presentation for us and some demos. Uh, so what sort of things will we be learning about today? Sure, Brett. So we've seen a lot of new features and functionalities being released in the past six to eight weeks around Maps Engine. And so I thought, let's dedicate this episode to talking about these changes. So I'll start with Google Maps Gallery that was launched end of Feb. And then we'll talk about the various products that are under the Maps Engine brand today, just to add more clarity. And then we'll get into some of the changes that have happened, like in GME styling, higher API limits, and query capabilities. That's great. So why don't we start with one of the first things you mentioned, the Google Maps Gallery. Sure. So Google Maps Gallery is a new Google product where anybody can look for and find rich, compelling maps. It is powered by Maps Engine, and the aim really is to make mapping data more discoverable by the public. So organizations with relevant, high-value public content will be able to make use of Maps Gallery to publish their Maps Engine maps and make it more discoverable. These organizations get a whole new channel for distributing their content, while the public gets access to these high-value public content. It's a win-win situation for both. So let me jump into the Google Maps Gallery site right here, which is at maps.google.com gallery. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of maps like US school ratings, unemployment rates in the European Union, and you can even start looking for things like crisis maps, and the list goes on. I'm going to go ahead and click on one of these maps right here. And really, the display reminds you of the whole Maps Engine experience, because these are ultimately Maps Engine maps. On the left-hand side, you'll see the layer listing right here. And this link right here, View in Google Earth, lets you view the same map inside of Google Earth. Now, one more cool thing about this is you can actually search for these maps under Google Search. So I'm going to go ahead and type US School Ratings Map. And when I click on the first result link, it brings me back to the map that we just took a look at. So more discoverable to the public through Google Search. So I know we've already had a lot of people wanting to participate in this program. And I'm sure there's people watching this recording now feeling like they too would want to get involved. So for them, what would be the next step? Good question, Brett. So for our enterprise map engine customers, they would already have access to their Maps Engine account if they're already creating maps. All they got to do is log in as their administrator. So let me jump into my console right here. So under the Map Details page, you will see under Gallery a Submit This Map link. So all the admin has to do is just click on this link and follow the steps, and their map should be able to uh, be shared through Maps Gallery. Now, for those who have a lot of good mapping data that they think will be beneficial for the public, but they do not have access to a Maps Engine account, we have what we call the Maps Engine Public Data Program. Right here on this site. So what this program allows you to do is sign up for a Maps Engine platform account. And once it's approved, these organizations will be able to start creating maps and submitting it to Gallery. Now, there is no fee or cost to joining this program, but the terms clearly state that you are getting Maps Engine access just so you can create maps with the intention of submitting it to Gallery. So it's not for commercial or private use. And there are slightly lower limits compared to the uh, Maps Engine platform that you get as a enterprise customer. I know a lot of people are going to be happy to hear that there is no cost barrier. Um, that's fantastic. Now, I know you wanted to talk more about sort of just some of our Maps Engine products overall. Exactly, Brett. And so I just wanted to take a step back and look at all the products under the Maps Engine brand umbrella and explain how they differ from each other, just to add more clarity, because there's been a few questions around that and hopefully provide some guidance when choosing which Maps Engine product is the right one for you. So we have, of course, Maps Engine platform for our enterprise customer. Uh, this platform is running through the cloud. So this is where customers will be able to upload their vector and imagery data, style it, be able to share it out with their users, both as public maps and private maps. And this particular product is price based on usage. 
But of course, we wanted to have something for the consumer side. And so early last year, we launched Maps Engine Lite. This is a free product. And essentially, if you have a Gmail account, you can just go to mapsengine.google.com slash map and start using Maps Engine Lite. It is free, hence it's not for commercial use, and it does come with slightly lower limits compared to the enterprise version, and it may not have all the features, but you are able to start uploading your CSV and creating maps out of it. So it's really great for map enthusiasts for creating personal maps like your favorite bike path. And later last year, we also launched Maps Engine Pro, kind of between the light and the platform version. This is a paid product. The pricing model is slightly different. It's a per seat model. This is ideal for information workers and business professionals to create stylized maps, collaborate with other users, and make informed decisions out of those maps. One last thing. There is also this free Maps Engine project. You can think of it as a trial where we let individuals sign up for a new Maps Engine project using their Google account, so the account you use for Gmail and G+. Now, this gives them access to a Maps Engine platform account. So one key takeaway from this discussion on this slide is that there's a lot of confusion between light and the free version. These are two completely different things. The free trial Maps Engine project right here gets you access to a Maps Engine platform, whereas the light version is very much a simplified product with a lot lesser features. Okay, so just to go back to the Google Maps gallery for a moment, can you publish to the gallery with any of the Google Maps Engine products? Great question, Brett. So I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, today, we only support maps coming out of Maps Engine platform, and that includes the public data program that we just talked about. Uh, today, we don't support maps coming out of Maps Engine Lite and Pro, but things will change in the future. Okay, uh, let's hear a little bit more about the improvements of the API. Sure, and I'm gonna start by talking about the higher limits for GME API. And so as developers start creating applications using the API, I'm sure most of them have come to a point where they realize, you know, I wish I could access bigger tables with the API or I wish I had higher QPS. And so now that's available. Once you verify your developer project, you can get access to larger vector tables uh, in the five million range. And you also get higher QPS for queries with the intersects parameter. Right here is a sample. So the intersects parameter allows you to kind of focus on a subset of vector features instead of the whole set. And when you use these kind of queries, you can go as high as 300 queries per second. So let me show you where all that can happen. Now, if you take a look at the Maps Engine documentation site under the limit section, if you scroll down a little, these are the initial limits for every project. But by just filing a support ticket using your project number and your Maps Engine account number, you'll be able to get access to much higher limits, which is under the table right here. Now, going back to the queries with the intersects parameter, the way it works is the intersects parameter is applied first, and then you get a subset of smaller features to focus and apply the other where clauses on, which is why if the result of the intersects parameter uh, results in zero to tens or twenties of the features, you can go as up as 300 queries per second. That's great. So these higher limits are something that developers have been asking for for a while, right? Yes, and they'll be glad that it's out. And there's one more feature that's been asked for a lot, and now it's out. So what this is, is an extension to the API, and so now you'll be able to query an asset's parents. Now. As a Maps Engine user, if you've been using it for a while, you'll end up with lots of data sources, layers, and maps. And after a while, you lose track. You don't know which layers are in which maps. And so when you make changes, you won't be able to gauge the impact. And so what this lets you do is be able to find out, let's say, which maps include which layer. So if I intend to make a change to layer one, let's say, I would know that it will impact map one and two, and so I'll be better prepared and make sure that I propagate these changes. So basically what this means is before I make a change to an asset, I can easily know ahead of time who's going to be affected by that change. That's exactly what it does. And so let me jump into the short demo I prepared right here. So I have a sample query here that is trying to query the parents of a particular layer. I'm going to copy this line and use the OAuth Playground to run this query. 
And so when I run this query on the right hand side, you can see that in the parent list, I see a parent ID, an asset ID. And so I have the other query to run using that particular ID. And when I send that query through, I get the details about that parent. And here it says it's a map. And so from this list, I can gauge that there's only one map that's going to be affected when I make any changes to that layer. And you can use this for any other asset that you find inside your account. Great. That was really simple. Um, now, I know there's one last thing to share that we've known people to be very excited about already. And it actually relates to the way that users can style and actually represent their data using Google Maps Engine. Sure, and that's proportional circles. That was released just two weeks back. And so let me use an example. Imagine you had a vector table with a list of all the cities in the world. So that's a few thousand uh, vector features. And so you want to map these cities out on a map as circles. And you use the population of each city to represent the size of the circle. So you'll have bigger circles for densely populated cities and smaller circles for not so densely populated cities. And so you end up with a map that looks something like this, right? And you can actually do this with any other number-based attribute. For example, based on the number of traffic lights in the city or based on the number of underground train stations. So this number will decide uh, how big the circle is gonna be. And so I'm gonna jump into another demo right here. So I've prepared a layer and I'm gonna go into the layer style editor. Now what you see here is you have the rule-based styling that was available all this while and now we've added a proportional circles um, feature to the styling section right here. And so you can easily choose which particular attribute you wanna do the proportional circles based on. And for the example, I'm going to go ahead and use the 2010 population. And so it's going to fetch the range of all the values for that attribute. And in the same way, I can choose the range for the radius of the circle, right? Uh, from the smaller circle to the bigger circle. And so it's more like uh, dividing the population values into buckets of sizes. And what you see is on display right here. So one watch point on this particular feature is that today you can create proportional circles for all the supported vector files except CSVs. Okay, understood on the CSV factor, but overall, this is an extremely useful and understandable way to clearly represent the data on the map. And I'm hardly surprised at why it's been so popular. Ajay, thanks for putting all of this together. I know I speak for our viewers when I say we appreciate you taking a time out to share what you and the team have been working on. My pleasure, Brett. So when do you think we may see you again for our next episode? Sure. So we're planning to do this on a quarterly basis. So hopefully next quarter we have a new episode for our viewers. Well, that's great. Um, everyone, that concludes this episode of What's New in Enterprise Maps. Thanks for sharing part of your day with us, and thanks for being a Google Enterprise Maps user. See you again soon.